Welcome to the Dr. Geo Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Geo, where it is my goal to share with you some of my research insights and tools that will help your urological function and simply live better with age. So I want to talk to you today about the PSA test and what it really means and how to best use it without abusing it and how to have a better conversation with your urologist about this test. Let's talk about your prostate for a second. If you have a prostate, I know perhaps many of you don't have a prostate anymore and probably have a high PSA regardless because you had your prostate removed for having prostate cancer. So you had a prostatectomy. So how it works is in a normal situation where a man has their prostate, your prostate gland makes PSA. And this Prostate specific antigen, PSA, has one job, is to help with conception, fertilization. The PSA never really makes it to your bloodstream, or it should not make it to your bloodstream. So essentially, what a PSA value from blood work is, is PSA leakage. The only thing that causes your number to go up upon getting a blood test is PSA leakage that I'm talking about, leaking into the bloodstream. So let's make some sense of this. The range that is provided to you from your lab work is somewhere between zero to four. So if your PSA is a three, oh, it's within that range, so I'm good. And if it's 4.1 or 4.2, ooh, that may mean that I have prostate cancer. And that's not true. If a man is, let's say, 42 years old, give or take, and his PSA is 2.5, it's within that range. But it might be a little high for a 40-year-old. If you are 62 years old and you have a 2.5 PSA, that may not be that high. So PSA is age-dependent. It's not just a matter of whether it's within the 0 to 4 range or not. The rapid rise in PSA is probably, in many instances, more valuable than just that absolute number. That may or may not mean that it's prostate cancer. I don't know. And the velocity, or what's called PSA kinetics, how PSA number changes within time, it's probably more valuable than the absolute number. How about after you're diagnosed with prostate cancer? How does it work? If it does rise with high kinetics and high velocity very rapidly after prostate cancer treatment, then we need to test a little bit more and figure out if it's prostate cancer progression and see what's the next approach. Now, prostate cancer or PSA recurrence after treatment from anything, it's not an uncommon scenario. It happens often. And if it stays increasing with low velocity, then if there's prostate cancer recurrence in that scenario, it may not be that bad. Can there be an increase in PSA and it's not associated with prostate cancer after prostate cancer treatment? Some studies suggest that, yes, it may be. When a surgeon goes into your body and removes the prostate, it is possible that they can leave behind some benign prostate tissue. And that benign prostate tissue can make PSA that leaks into your bloodstream. So that is possible, but typically the PSA rise would not be that rapid, and it would be a very slow rise in that scenario. What's the problem with the PSA test? The problem is that it was used, abused, and misused. PSA rose and it prompted urologists to do biopsies, oftentimes unnecessarily. People were overtreated, increased the cost of healthcare significantly. So oftentimes when I'm consulting with patients, if they're seeing me for the first time and their PSA is of a certain value, and if it's maybe a little bit high, we don't rush to get a biopsy right away. We look at different information to determine A, they need a biopsy, and B, What's the risk of them having prostate cancer? In other words, we risk stratify. And here's the other thing. I think most committees and medical organizations would suggest not to start taking PSA in men until the age of 50. And I disagree with that. I think that all men should get a PSA at 40. You have nothing to lose. Because if it's indeed high, you can do something about it early. If you have a family history of prostate cancer, father, brother, 
or you have certain genetic mutations that are associated with prostate cancer, I would get a PSA once a year starting at the age of 40. If you have no family history and no genetic mutation for prostate cancer, I would say start at 40 and probably get it every two to three years or so. I would say before going to your next blood draw for your PSA, I want you to take five really nice deep breaths before that blood draw because I believe that stress can increase PSA. When you go for the value and you go to discuss with your doctor what that number is, I would take another five deep breaths and do not catastrophize. I really hope this podcast today brings some clarity to you about the stress-induced biomarker, the PSA test, and how to best use it, how to best talk to your doctor about it, and how for it not to control your life, for it to just be a number that you look at to make certain decisions with regards to your health and your prostate health. Thanks for tuning in today. Don't forget to like this podcast and many others on all the channels, podcast channels, Apple, Spotify, YouTube. And I really appreciate you tuning in today. And I really appreciate your comments and subscribing. Much love to you all. This is Dr. Gio signing off. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Dr. Geo podcast. You can watch all episodes of this podcast and much more by subscribing to my YouTube channel on youtube.com forward slash Geo Espinoza ND. If you love what you heard today, you can help by leaving a five star review of the podcast on Apple and Spotify as each review helps us reach more men who are serious about improving their urological health and how to function better with age. And for the latest research and actionable takeaways in the world of men's health and integrative urology, sign up for my newsletter at drgeo.com. I'll see you next time. And now for a brief disclaimer. This podcast is for general information only, and we're not forming a doctor-patient relationship through this medium. The use of the information and all links associated with this podcast is at the listener's risk and is not to replace medical advice from a physician or a healthcare practitioner. Lastly, thoughts and opinions related to this podcast are my own and may not reflect the views of any institution or organization I'm associated with.